children are never too young to start learning life-saving techniques. You never know when a child might be the only one around in a moment of crisis. That moment came for 10-year-old Jacob Walsh in a quiet residential neighborhood of Pasadena, Texas, on October 30th, 1988. David Parker will never forget that Sunday morning. He looked at me and said, Daddy, is, is this a dream? I said, I sure well, I wished it was. The Parkers and the Walshes had lived next door to each other for years. On this day, like so many others, their sons were playing together in the backyard of David and Kathy Parker's house. I was just kind of walking around the house, drinking my coffee. He and Jacob and Kale were in my backyard on the patio playing. They were playing with the volcano. Her eight-year-old son, Kale's model volcano, had been built with the help of his father as a science project. They pour baking soda in the top of it, and they're supposed to see how it erupts. Next thing I knew, I saw them jump in the fence because Jacob lives next door. They wanted to use Jacob Walsh's skateboard ramp as a platform for the volcano. We just got it and brought it over to my backyard. Just set it on the middle of the ramp. Neither boy was allowed to use matches. We got a match and just put a match in there and burn the leaves. It just burned. The two boys kept trying to get a fire started in the volcano using matches and leaves while Jacob's grandmother worked just inside the house. I was washing dishes and I knew they were playing out in the backyard. I mean, they did that all the time. Terry as I went out the back door. I just chased after him and rolled him over on the ground. I just stood there. I, I couldn't move. When I was in kindergarten, I remember the stop, drop, and roll. And he wouldn't roll over, so I just rolled him over. If I wouldn't have rolled him over, he'd probably have died. I heard some screaming. He wasn't on fire anymore. But he was standing there telling me, Terry, I'm on fire, I'm on fire. And I told Jacob, I said, uh, run and get David. Jacob ran next door to get Kale's father, David. He couldn't even speak. He was, he was so wide. My son, I never saw him in such pain in my life and feel so helpless. I couldn't do nothing for him, really. He was terrifying. And a mother knows their child's cry. <laughs> it was very different. Kathy's call for help came in at 9.45 a.m. Number one, please state your emergency. I said, my son is burnt. He's in pain. I need an ambulance. Hurry up. Get here now. That's when they told me to put the water on him, the cold towels. I just try to comfort him. I mean, usually you can take care of your kids' pains and stuff, but... Something like that, you can't. Pasadena police officers were on the scene within three minutes. What happened? My heart was going 90 miles an hour. I just didn't want him to be in pain. When he was quiet, I could calm down. But then when he started reacting, I, I reacted with him. Paramedics James Kelton and Mark Donovan arrived less than two minutes later. I think when paramedics and EMTs deal with children, everybody gets a little nervous, a little uptight. You usually deal with adults who can tell you what's wrong and how they're feeling. But when you get children, they're, they're scared and they just want to be with mom or dad. I did notice the unique smell of burned flesh, which if you've never smelled burnt flesh before, it is a very unique scent that you will not soon forget. Burns were concentrated on his legs and I believe his left arm and his left ear. 
and a portion of his neck. It just looked like somebody had come and just peeled away a piece of skin and just exposing what was left out underneath it. Yeah, we basically made a sandwich out of him using what we call sterile burn sheets. Doused it down completely with sterile water. We felt that that would best serve reducing the pain and to put out any fire that may be remaining burning in the skin tissue itself. When they would pour the water on Kale's legs, he was all right for approximately a second to a minute. And then he would just start screaming. I begged them to give him something for pain, and they said that they couldn't. Kale was rushed to a nearby parking lot where a special helicopter landing zone had been set up. I was scared. I thought it was my fault because I poured the gas in there and I burned him. I had asked him, can I go with him? And the person who was behind Kale shook his head. And Kale, he started getting up off of the stretcher and he said, if my mama can't go with me, I'm not going. This one life flight nurse, she hugged me and she said, we'll take good care of him. And they just said that there's no room on the helicopter for me. I felt like dying. I was thinking he's probably terrified. Uh, I mean, I felt worse not being with him than I did being with him and not being able to help him. The flight to Herman Hospital in Houston took less than 12 minutes. There is no doubt that uh, burn injury is the most devastating type of injury that the human body can sustain. Dr. Donald Parks, a leading burn expert, was waiting to treat Kale. Okay, y'all, this is a nine-year-old. He was in a gasoline explosion. I recall that Kale coped very well. He was panicky, but he did cooperate uh, in all our requests. I noted that he had extensive burns, uh, including burns to his ear, to his back, both arms, and very deep burns to both legs. Many of the burns on his legs uh, were third degree, destroying all the layers of skin. The burns were subsequently cleaned to attempt to prevent contamination of the burn wound, which ultimately could lead to an infection. He was wrapped from head to toe with bandages. He looked like a mummy, and he had tubes everywhere. And he looked up at me and his dad, and he said, am I going to be in trouble for this? Well, at that point, I had to walk out of the room. You think kids know better, and I know Carol knew better, I know Jacob knew better, but they they think they got things under control, I guess. I think, oh, well, we know it's bad to do this, but, but it, you know, we can, we can play with it and not get hurt. But evidently they, they can't. In the year and a half since Cale Parker was burned, he's undergone a series of painful skin graft operations. Fire Marshal Bill Yearout believes that Cale survived because his friend Jacob acted quickly and knew what to do. When a person catches himself on fire, of course he panics and he's going to run. The technique of stop, drop, and roll saves lives. And uh, this is uh, the reason that this one boy is here today. If he hadn't no stop, drop, and roll, I don't, I don't think I'd be alive right now. I'd just keep on burning. Jacob's mother is proud of her son and grateful to the people who helped prevent a tragedy by teaching stop, drop, and roll. I have to give thanks to our fire department and for the time that they put into these kids at school. You know, the stop, drop, and roll method, if it saves one life, it's worth all the time that those people put into it. He has obvious scars, and those scars will be there. He'll be with him the rest of his life, and every time he looks at those scars, he'll know where they came from. He'll know, he'll recall the experience. I would tell other kids never to play with matches or never play with gasoline or not to do anything that you know would hurt you unless your parents are there. Now that's over with, I'm just going to do my best on everything I can do. Next. 
That is the worst death I could probably think of, to drown or be eaten by a shark. Anything but